Well, good day, folks. Here we are. We're back together again. Ah, guess what? This is Saturday. Tomorrow's Sunday. Tomorrow's the first day of autumn. Where did the summer go? Well, I digress. Here we are. We're continuing together. Oh, in this wonderful letter that we've been journeying together in, First Peter. What an amazing experience it's been for me. I hope it has been for you as well. Dictionary.com defines sarcasm as, quote, harsh, cutting, or bitter contempt, often using irony to point out the deficiencies or failings of someone or something, or, quote, a sharply ironical taunt. Now, I want to offer you a few quotes and challenge you to see if you can pick out the sarcasm. Uh, comedian Henry Youngman once said this, We always hold hands. If I let go, she shops. Actor and comedian Robin Williams said, Why do you call it rush hour when nothing moves? And last but not least, we have another actor and comedian, Buddy Hackett, who said this about his childhood. As a child, my family's menu consisted of two choices, take it or leave it. <laughs> Maybe some of you can uh, relate to that. But the question is, really, did you notice the sarcasm slipped in uh, alongside some comic relief. You know, growing up as kids, uh, we learned a children's rhyme that went like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, I decided to do a little deeper dive, checking this uh, children's rhyme out, and I found out that the earliest appearance uh, of this rhyme was uh, around 1830, and it came in a number of forms, in books. We also, fi we also find this children's rhyme was used in speeches. And uh, we fast forward to today, we also find this children's rhyme in popular music. For example, the English rock band Baby Shambles uh, named one of their songs, Sticks and Stones. Now, before Roger Daltrey uh, founded Baby Shambles, he was the lead vocalist for another English rock band. Can you guess that one? Well, it was The Who. And in their song, The Quiet One, this children's rhyme is included in the lyrics of that particular song. But let's take away the comedians, the actors, the authors, the speeches, the musicians, the popular music, and what do we have left? Well, we have words, don't we? It's words that make up our familiar children's rhyme, sticks and stones. And I asked myself, why did us kids use this particular rhyme? Was it not maybe for defense against name calling, against the verbal bullying? Maybe it was, it was to avoid physical retaliation because, hey, that guy was a big guy in front of me. Maybe we decided to be indifferent or maybe we were trying to remain calm in the situation. But whatever the reason we used, uh, we use this familiar rhyme, the reality is that the names that we were called or the names that we called others hurt. Friends, our words have significance. You know, the wisest man that has ever lived in all of human history, bar none to date and never will be one as wise as this, Solomon said this, words kill, words give life, they're either poison or fruit. You'll find that in Proverbs 18, 21. Well, friends, with all this in mind, let's turn, into our Bible, turn to our Bibles. That's where we want to be, the Word of God. We want to go to chapter 3, and we will read together from chapter 3, verse 8 to 18. Get some context uh, for our day today. Chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but in a contrary, bless. For to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 13, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you, if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them 
nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for a reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but but made alive in the Spirit. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Dear Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. And now as we turn our attention to do a little closer uh, look at these uh, particular verses, we just ask God that you would, by your spirit, uh, help us to do this. Uh, Teach us, lead us, form us, and shape us to be like your son Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are, uh, beginning in verse 8. And as we come to verse 8, we remember the context in which the recipients had received Peter's exhortations. Peter was writing to these first century uh, believers. These were Christians suffering from doing good, as we learned in chapter 1, from a variety of trials. So with this in the forefront of our minds, the Apostle Peter began here in verse 8 by addressing all of you. All of who? Well, all believers in general. This would include everything that Peter has already addressed, the masters, the servants, the slaves, the wives, the husbands, their children, everyone, all of you, all of you. Along with this, we also must bring along with us here to verse 8, God's command to submit. Because after all, a Christian is a Christian because first and foremost, they submit themselves under Christ. James puts it this way in his letter, he Uh, said, submit yourselves therefore to God, James 4 and 7. So as Christians are to submit or or to subject themselves, as Peter would say, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, and he would also say this is the will of God, chapter 2, verse 13 and 15. So as Christians are to subject themselves to their masters, we don't say that word anymore today, we say employers, with all respect, Peter would say, chapter 2, verse 18. And as wives are to be subject to your own husbands. We looked at that last week, chapter 3, verse 1. And Peter reminds us that husbands are to what? Love your wives as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5, 23. And even in that letter, Paul reminds us as the church, the body of Christ, you and I submit to Christ. All of you are to mutually submit to one another. Did you understand that? We're to submit to one another. Now, I need to pause here for for a moment. But clearly, this whole idea of submission does not, first of all, sit well with our sinful human nature. For after all, we do want to do life our own way, don't we? And when we consider our culture, a very individualistic culture, submission is not often well received and even sometimes seen as a sign of weakness in a person. And that's kind of interesting because we know intrinsically that we need to submit or we need submission to have some sort of order or stability in society. And when that's not there, we've already seen the results of that. But for the Christian, the Apostle Peter, who was inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, commands all Christians to submit themselves to God first and to human and the human chain of command as well, and to one another. But we we should talk about what submission is not, what biblical submission is not. We'll 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 call it biblical submission to keep within that context. For example, anyone who is in authority over a Christian that requires or demands that Christian to disobey the word of God said Christian must not obey that authority. We also know that biblical submission is not agreeing on everything. This is different than than rebelling. We don't always have to agree on everything. We have to agree on, of course, the essentials of the Bible's doctrines, but we don't have to agree on everything. 
Biblical submission also does not mean that we leave our brains in a bucket somewhere. We bring our minds, our reasoning. We bring that beautiful uh, reasoning and logic that God gave us to use for his glory. Biblical submission doesn't mean we don't try to influence others for good, not for evil. Biblical submission is not putting someone else's will above or before the will of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are some examples of what biblical submission is not. Let's get back to our text. After clearly defining his audience, the Apostle Peter said this. Let's read that together. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Verse 8. So what we have here are five qualities, five traits, if you will, that every believer is called to obey. Pastor John Piper, in his treatment of this particular uh, text, said this of these five uh, qualities in verse 8. Piper said, quote, He calls us first to be a kind of people. Not just to do a list of things, but to be a kind of people. So friends, in other words, if you allow me to... Um, Paraphrase, Apostle Peter exhorted his audience, brothers and sisters, be a certain kind of people. Be a certain kind of people, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Chapter 2, verse 18. Be a certain kind of people when one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. Same chapter 2, verse 19. Be a certain kind of people even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake. This is in our chapter 3 here, verse 14. Be a certain kind of people, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. That's back in chapter 2, verse 21. Please read those verses. Be the kind of people who had received the mercy of God, which had what? Caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's all the way back in chapter 1, verse 3. Peter's saying, be that kind of people. So obviously the question I'm going to ask is, are we that kind of people? What about the P uh, Peter's instructions here in verse 8? You know, uh, 8 to 12, I mean. You know, don't repay evil with evil. We read those together. Don't repay an insult with an insult. Or how about the command to treat each other with brotherly love? Are we that kind of people? Well, truth be told, uh, the apostles' instructions here really does rub up against us, first of all, our sinful human nature. We all, as the hymn put it so well, are prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, prone, prone to scorn you in your love. My friends, without God's mercy and salvation, without the forgiveness of sins, without the shed blood of Christ for you and me on our behalf, you and I would not be able or even care one iota to be the kind of people Peter's letter calls us to be. Well, let's start looking a little closer at verse 8. Be the kind of people, Peter said here, who have unity of mind. Now the NIV, if you have one, or the New King James, translates this Greek adjective as one mind. We want to turn to the Apostle Paul for some helpful commentary. Paul, writing to the Roman church, said this, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, verse 5 and 6. I think you might understand a little more now what Peter is saying here, to have unity of mind. See, the Apostle Peter and Paul exhorting believers to be united in spirit, if you will, to have a common mindset the same thoughts, for example, concerning the Word of God, to be of one mind in, the, in their conduct in the face of suffering, in the face of persecution. To be of one mind concerning the essentials of salvation. Consider with me harmony in music. Now, harmony in music is a way that 
uh, chords and different pitches are combined to create what? To create unity of movement in that piece of music. So friends, in a similar way, the apostle exhorts the believers, all of you, that's including us here today, to be harmonious, to have unity of mind. And when attaining and maintaining the unity of mind in the body of Christ, it must look like something. Or as Piper said, you are a kind of people. It, it must manifest itself in a certain way. And we see here in the text that it reveals a certain kind of people who are, as the NIV put it, sympathetic. Verse 8, the New King James, having compassion for one another. Verse 8. The root word of the Greek adjective translated by the ESV that I'm using, sympathy, means to suffer with, to suffer with. In other words, to have sympathy means that we feel what others feel. Sure, we might not have the same experiences, of course. We not might not even be in that particular circumstance. But we respond to the other person with compassion to their situation, to their needs. Genuine, genuine sympathy would not say, I know how you feel. Because if you know how someone feels, you will also know how unhelpful it is to hear, I know how you feel. Because genuine sympathy is being fully present with the other person. And how does that look, being fully present with the other person? It has a, it has a physical appearance, did you know? Both ears are open, your mouth is closed, your eyes and body are focused on that one individual and nowhere else. That's what genuine sympathy looks like. Well, moving along, unity in mind reveals itself as brotherly love, verse 8. The NIV has a love one another. The New King James, love as brothers. And the meaning behind, my friends, the meaning behind this original Greek adjective is loving one like a brother in this particular context. Apostle Paul, in his letters to the Ephesian church, said this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which, you, pardon me, you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. We go to John chapter 13. We see there Jesus, shortly before his arrest and death, uh, said to his disciples this, A new commandment I give you, give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. My friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't see each other as strangers. We're not just some acquaintance. We see each other as family. And of course, come on, let's be absolutely transparent. Families argue and even have some serious disputes. But as someone once said, we might fight and argue, but in the end, we're family. Moving along, unity of mind is made manifest, is revealed by a tender heart, verse 8. This could also be translated kind-hearted. This particular Greek word is very interesting. One, for one reason, it's only used twice in the New Testament, here in Peter's letter and in the Apostle Paul's letter to Ephesus, where Paul said, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you, Ephesians 4.32. Now, we need to know that this is not a word describing our behavior. Because the literal translation of this Greek means to feel generous in your belly. I'll say it again. To feel generous in your belly. Fair's uh, Greek lexicon translates this Greek word, or Greek uh, word, yes, having strong bowels. This is, that doesn't sound like tender-hearted, does it? But we, we, sometimes the translate, we, we lose the translation. We lose the meaning in the translation, the original meaning. But anyways, what we have here is one of the greatest, one of the, pardon me, one of the strongest Greek words to express compassion in another. So to have a tender heart, to be tender hearted, is to feel compassion for another person deep down, deep down in that place 
where our emotions and feelings are found and exist. This is called actively sharing in someone's emotional experience. So the ability to share and understand some other's experience. This is not something we're born with. This is something that we learn. This is a skill. And I pray that we are learning and growing in that all the time. Well, friends, at least but not least, we have the icing on the cake, if you will. I don't know if that's the right way of saying this, because it's not going to sound too sweet in a minute. Paul, uh, Peter went on to say, all of you be of a humble mind, verse 8. We go towards the end of Peter's letter here, 1 Peter. We, after he gives his instructions to the elders, he, turns, he turned his attention, uh, his attention pardon me, toward the believers, and he said this in chapter 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he might exalt you. Chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. Well, here we have humility, the last virtue in Peter's list, but without a doubt and with certainty, the hardest to attain. Now, you might be asking, Pastor, why is humility so hard to attain? Well, I'll just give you one word. Pride. Pastor John Stott said, quote, Pride is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. C.S. Lewis said, quote, The utmost evil is pride. Pastor John Jason Meyer, speaking about pride, said, quote, God opposes pride actively and hates it passionately. And the glory of God and the pride of man has two possible crash sites, hell or the cross. Either we pay for our sins in hell, or Christ pays for our sins on the cross. Pride of man is their greatest, greatest, greatest sin. Now, as we ponder these things, let's consider the Apostles' exhortation here a little closer to be of a humble mind. Solomon said this about humility. The wisest man that has ever lived said, One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. You find that in Proverbs 29, verse 12. We dig a little deeper into the original meaning. The ESV, I believe, has, the, has really captured the essential sense of the original language and meaning, a humble mind. See, humility is not found on, is found only on the, no, pardon me, humility is found on the inside of a person. For Solomon put it so well, as we read, one who is lowly in spirit describes the internal motivation and attitudes of a person. A humble mind knows that it's absolutely dependent on God for everything whether it be food, whether it be uh, safety, whether it be health, whether it be life and faith, everything, a humble mind, absolutely dependent on God. King David gives us an example of a humble mind dependent on God when King David prayed this prayer. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Psalm 25, verse 1 to 5. We go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. You can turn your Bibles to there. And there we'll find uh, recorded for us the Lord's Prayer. Jesus there teaching his disciples how a person with a lowly spirit, a person with a humble mind, prays. Jesus said, pray like this then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts and as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. A humble mind knows, absolutely knows, that apart from the grace of God in Christ, they are dead in their sins. And this amazing grace, this amazing grace that's been poured out onto this world by Jesus Christ, this free gift of God in Christ, rises up in that kind of uh, spirit, that lowly spirit, 
and proclaims along with the psalmist, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy all your, up, all your, all your upright, all you, your upright in heart. I, don't know, I think I misspelled that. Psalm 32, 11 anyways. So friends, Apostle Peter said, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. You know, when we started, uh, we, we said that words have significance. And here in verse 8, we have Peter's words that describe the inside of a person. And it's not so much about how we conduct ourselves. It's more about the kind of person you and I are, insi- uh, I are inside. It's about a certain kind of people. So the question is, you call yourself a Christian. A Christian. You love God. You read his word. But what kind of person are you? And as a people of God, what kind of people are we? Are we the kind of people that Peter described here in verse 8? Are we of the same mindset? Are we sympathetic? Do we love one another as brothers, as a family? Are we genuinely deep down inside, deep down inside, tender-hearted? Are we lowly in spirit? Are we the real deal? Are we, as Peter said, you are God's people? Are we that? Are we God's people? Well, I pray that we are. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray for my friends out there. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I don't know uh, what they're de- dealing with in their bodies, in their finances, in the world. But I know, Lord, that they would trust you. You will give them a life worth living. Because you are the great God who has forgiven us of our sins through your son, Jesus Christ. We praise you, we bless you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.